Well, we need to be thankful to God for this Lord's Day and the fact that we're able to be able to assemble together as the people of God and with visitors. We're glad to have the visitors. Hope you will be profited by being with us in our study. I encourage you to come back and be with us whenever you can. It's always a joy and privilege to have visitors, and we thank you so much. And those who are live streaming, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. It's good that we were able to get through this storm. There are others who were not so fortunate as uh, Brother Kerry has just brought out and the Cortez, they're having a real difficult time. Also up in Ashton, North Carolina, a really bad time. And we certainly pray for those brethren and others who are involved in that. And we hope that God will be with them and bless them in those things they may need. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gave a model prayer. It's oftentimes referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And it is referred that way mistakenly. It is not the Lord's Prayer. If you want to know what the Lord's Prayer is, turn and read John 17. That's the greatest prayer recorded anywhere in Scripture. It's the longest prayer that Jesus ever prayed. It's his high priestly prayer. He prays for himself. He prays for the apostles. He prays for those who hear him through the apostles' teaching. And it's a beautiful prayer. Now the model prayer is given as a model. As a model that is to be used not as a vain repetition. It's interesting that those who often recite this prayer as though it's some kind of, of chance or some kind of charm or some, something like that. Rather than to understand its meaning. And Jesus gave it as a model and he prefaced those remarks in the prayer. If you'll read the verses preceding this with you're not to use vain repetition. So those who just cite the prayer and don't think about what it means are actually guilty of what the Lord says you're not to do. You're not to use vain repetition. So the prayer can be used in that way. But on the other hand, I wonder how many of us who might use this as a pattern or a model for prayer, oftentimes will say some of the things involved in this prayer and say them in such a way that we really aren't appreciating what the words mean. For an example, Jesus said in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now how many times have people addressed God in this way? And it's a good way to do it. How many times have people addressed God as our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name? have never stopped to think about what is involved in that phrase. What's involved in our Father who is in heaven? What's involved in how would be your name? When we understand what the scripture teaches in these matters, we'll have a greater understanding of the fact that when we address God in this way, we ought not to do it in a light flippant manner. We ought not to do it as a matter of rote memory. But we ought to do it realizing the importance of what's being said when we pray in this way. Who it is that we're addressing? Why it is that we're able to address him? All of the blessings that accrue to us because he is our father. When we think about these things, it adds meaning and purpose to our prayers. And there are four things I want to suggest to you that come to my mind when I think of the expression... Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? I want to talk with you about three of these in our present study. The fourth one, how would be thy name or your name, I want to deal with next Lord's Day. But let's think about the expression, how would be your name next Lord's Day. And today, let's think about our Father in heaven. What does that mean? What does that indicate when we say such a thing as that? Well, it indicates, first of all, when we say our Father in heaven, the authority of God. God's authority. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 25, the Bible says that we are to remember that the Lord is in heaven and that we are not to refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks to us from heaven. Now in the context here of Hebrews chapter 12, 
you will find what he is saying is a contrast between God as he appeared to the Israelites in the Old Testament in the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and contrasting that with God, the giving of Christ in the New Testament on Mount Zion, spiritual Mount Zion. So there's a vivid contrast. Now if you go back and look at what Hebrews 12 says about that, you'll see that when God gave the law through Moses, the record says that the people were exceedingly afraid and the earth was quaking. There was a great noise. There was a tremendous amount of commotion going on and the people were scared to death. I want to read just a portion of that. As you look at this and note in verse 18 beginning, it says, You have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burn with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word would not be spoken to them anymore. The people were so frightened when the Lord spoke on Mount Sinai that they asked Moses, ask God not to speak to us anymore like this. And it says, they could not endure what was commanded. And if such as much as a beast touches the mountain, it should be uh, stoned or th shot with a, an arrow. <clears throat> And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and tremble. Even Moses, even the man of God was so scared, was so afraid that he was trembling. He was astonished. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion. You've come to spiritual Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. And he goes on to describe that we in the Lord's church have come to spiritual Zion. Not the Zion that Moses and the Israelites came to that was calculated to cause them to fear and to tremble. Because of the holiness of God. Because God is a holy God. But we've come to a spiritual kingdom. A spiritual Mount Zion. And he describes that as you read further through this chapter. And he says, I want to read it again. I read it a moment ago. It says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. So when we pray, our Father in heaven, we are praying to him who has the authority. We're praying to God who is a holy God. And we need to be terrified at disobeying that holy God. But on the other hand, we need to be comforted because now in Christ Jesus, we see the mercy of God and the love of God displayed. We see the forgiveness of God. We see the adoption that we have received into the family of God as his children. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can pray our Father in heaven, recognizing the authority that God has. Further in that regard, you'll find where the record says that God speaks now through his Son. If you look at Hebrews chapter 1 in the first three verses, the Hebrew writer says thusly, God who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now God spoke in different ways and in different times to the fathers by the prophets. But now in these last days, these days in which we're now living, described as the last days, he spoke to us by his son. He no longer speaks through the prophets. He's speaking through his son. His son is to be heard. God has the authority. God has the power. And he's speaking now through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, for whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So that is a summation of what Christ has done for us. He has died on the cross. He has shed his blood. He's given his life. He's been raised from the dead. He's been exalted at the right hand of God. And now God has given him all power and all authority. That is stated by the Lord himself. After he was raised from the dead, before he ascended back to the Father, in Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission as recorded by Matthew. Beginning at verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So God has the authority. And when we pray our Father in heaven, 
We're recognizing that authority. And if we're Christians, we're submitting to that authority. Now, the world's not going to submit to the authority of God. We know that. But as Christians, we are to submit to the authority of God. Anytime a person as a Christian would say, well, I know the Bible teaches thus and so, but I, I'm going to do something different. That's not right. That's not what a Christian should say. When God says something, that's the truth. That's it. That settles it. There's no other option for the Christian but what God says. He's the one who has all authority. He's the one who's all powerful. He's the one that caused the Israelites to shake and quiver and to tremble at the giving of the law because he's a holy God and we are not. <coughs> we're his creatures and we're those who are subject to his will. In Hebrews, again, as you look at your Bible, it says, <coughs> as you look at, uh, actually, Acts chapter 2 is where the Lord commissioned the apostles to preach on Pentecost. He gave the authority to Christ, all powers to give unto him, Matthew 28, 20. But he says in Acts 2, 36 to 38, when Peter is preaching on Pentecost, the first time the gospel is preached in its fullness, as he is guided by the Holy Spirit along with the other apostles, and they're preaching as the Spirit gives them guidance, the Bible says, convincing those folks that they have murdered the Son of God. Therefore, he said in verse 36, that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. He has been made Lord. He's the ruler. He is the appointed prophet, priest, and king. He is the Christ. He's the Messiah of the Old Testament. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Why were they cut to the heart? Because they realized the sin they had committed. They realized they had crucified their own Messiah. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It would have been a sad thing if Peter had said, There's not anything you can do. You have murdered your Messiah. You've crucified the Christ. You can't do anything. Now that's not what he said. That's not what your Bible says either. Look at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 41, the Bible says those who glad received his word were baptized, and there added unto them about 3,000 souls. So God has given his message to his son. His son gave it to the apostles through the Holy Spirit, revealing it to them. And thus we have in the word of God, God's authority being stated. And anyone who's out of Christ, who's not a Christian, needs to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, needs to recognize that He has been raised from the dead and exalted at the right hand of God, and He has all authority, both in heaven and on earth, and He has commissioned the apostles to preach the gospel, and that gospel includes that people need to repent of their sins and be baptized for remission of their sins. And if you've not been baptized for remission of your sins, you've not been baptized Scripture. You may have been baptized, but unless you're baptized in order to receive remission of sins, you've not been baptized like the Scriptures say. And that's just too plain to misunderstand. But we need to add another point to this. Jesus commissioned the apostles not only to preach on Pentecost, but he also requires Christians to live a godly life. Look at your Bible in Titus 2, 11 and 12. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now that doesn't mean that all men are going to be saved. And he goes on to say why? Teaching us. Teaching who? Teaching us, those who are Christians. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That's the negative. You're denying ungodliness, you deny worldly lust, and the positive is live soberly, righteously, and God in this present age. So God tells us through the Apostle Paul, that we're to live exemplary lives. We're to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Paul put it like this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, again talking to Christians, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't let the world tell you how to think. Don't let the world tell you how to live. Don't let the world set the standard for how you dress and how you talk and how you live. You let the Word of God, you be transformed. You have that inner change that's exhibited in an outward change. You have the change in your heart that's demonstrated in the change of your life. He said, I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind needs to be renewed to the will of God. Why? So that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when we think about our Father in heaven... We think about the fact that he is the one who has all power and all authority. He has delegated that to his son. 
His son is delegated to the apostles, the revelation of the New Testament. And we have that word where we can read and understand and know what God wants us to do. You know, that we might please him. Our Father in heaven. What a great sta statement of his authority. But a second thought comes to mind. We have fellowship with God. Now, it's one thing to think about God ruling over us. It's another to think about the fact that God has fellowship with his people. Now, that's an amazing thing. When you think about the greatness of God, the God who spoke and the world came into being. When you think about the enormity of the universe and how that each one of us is just a small speck of dust on this creation that God has made that is enormous. <coughs> <coughs> And we have fellowship with God. That is a tremendous thought. John 16 and 32, Jesus said this, Indeed, the hour is coming, yet now has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own, and will, and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. Now what Jesus is saying there is, the Father and I are in perfect agreement. We're in fellowship with one with another. He says a similar thought in John 8 and verse 29, He's, <clears throat> he who sent me is with me. The Father's not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Jesus was always in a relationship of fellowship with his Father because he always did those things that pleased him. How many of us do the things that please God always? We don't do it. We sin. We fall short. We go beyond what the scriptures prescribe. We live lives that are not pleasing unto God when we sin in that way. But Jesus always did the things that pleased his Father. He was an always in fellowship with him. Now that doesn't mean we cannot be in fellowship with God. We can be. Because when we pray our Father in heaven, it indicates our fellowship with him. And that's because God is a forgiving God of his mercy and his grace. Look at 1 John 1, 5 through 9. This is a message which we heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we do not practice the truth. Now those who claim to be Christians, and yet they live ungodly lives, and claim that God loves them and loves everybody, and so he uh, passes over their sins, they're lying. They're practicing error. They're practicing lawlessness. And the Bible says they're lying. I'm not saying that. God said it. He said, if you say you have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, you lie and do not practice the truth. But... Now here's the contrast. As Christians, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now someone says, preacher, do you live a perfect life? No, I do not. I'm a better preacher than I am a practicer. What do I mean by that? I preach a perfect gospel, but I'm not a perfect practicer. I sin from time to time. Well, what does that mean? That means that I have to confess those sins to God and ask his forgiveness. And when I repent of my sins and confess them, the Bible says the Lord will forgive me. Now, some preachers are apt to quote this passage and others like it to show that an alien sinner can pray and God will forgive him. That's not so. Alien sinners are not told to pray. You notice in Acts 9 where Saul of Tarsus, when he was converted, was told to go into Damascus and be told him what he must do. Acts 22, 16, when he relates that conversion account later in life, he says, Ananias came to him and said, Why tarest thou? Now he had been praying for three days and nights. Why did he not pray the sinner's prayer? Because it was not a valid thought. It's not a valid thing to do. He was told to stop praying, why tearest thou, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. That's what a person has to do to be saved. That's what a person has to do to be in fellowship with God. But once a person becomes a Christian and sins, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Someone might say, preacher, if, if a Christian sins, does he have to be baptized again? No, the Bible doesn't teach that. If it did, we would be baptized again. But it doesn't teach that a person needs to be baptized scripturally except one time. And as a Christian, when that person sins, he can confess that sin to God and God will forgive him according to what the record says in 1 John 1 and verse 9. Being in fellowship with God, and that means... <coughs> 
that we have God's will and that we are to obey God's will. Now here's an amazing thought. God works through Christians to accomplish his will. And it's only through them that the preaching of the gospel is done. It's only through them that we are manifesting Jesus Christ in our lives as we show others what it means to be a Christian. Matthew 5, 16 comes to mind where the Lord said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So our good works should be glorifying God. And as others see that in us, they know that we're different. They know that we have something they don't have, perhaps. And they are constrained by that, if they're honest, to glorify God. In 1 John 3, Paul makes an amazing statement I want to share with you at this time. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, in verse 9, For we are, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation... And another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the only foundation, Jesus Christ. And we are fellow workers with God. Did you think about what that means? God wants us to be fellow workers with him. He wants us to work with him. He wants us to work his will. And we do that in our lives when we live as Christians. I think about the song 460 in our book, The World's Bible. And when I think about the fact that we are the world's Bible, you know, you're the only Bible a lot of people are ever going to see. A lot of people are not reading their Bibles. They're not studying the Word of God. But they're going to see it when they see you living as a faithful Christian. It says, Christ has no hands but our hands to do His work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongue but our tongues to tell men how he died. <clears throat> he has no help but our help to bring them to his side. Did you ever stop and think about the fact that if you don't bring others to Christ that you have an influence over, that you might be able to bring to the Lord, if you don't do that, it won't get done? Christ is not going to work a miracle to cause a person to come to believe in him like he did with Saul of Tarsus. He's not doing that now. He has your hands. He has your feet. He has your tongue to do his work. And we are fellow workers with God. And he goes on to say in second stanza, we're the only Bible the careless world will read. <clears throat> we are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. We are the Lord's last message given in deed and word. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? You know, in Matthew 5, 16, again, when the Lord said, let your light so shine, a lot of people have their light, but it's become dim. Sin is besmirching. The testimony they could be giving through their lives. They could be showing an example of a faithful Christian, but they're using vulgar language. They're gossiping. Christians are lying. Christians are committing fornication sometimes and adultery. Christians are doing things they ought not to do. And people see that and they think, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want any part of that. And they would be right in thinking that way. What if the, what if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? What if our hands are busy with other things than this? Now, there are Christians who are good moral people, but their hands are busy with so many things that are involved in their own interests rather than interest themselves in what other people might think and do and want and need that they don't have time for other people. What if our hands are busy with other things than his? What if our feet are walking where sin's allurement is? What if our tongues are speaking of things his life would spurn? What if, <clears throat> how can we hope to help him and welcome his return? Think about that. Think about this. When a person dies, the only thing that matters is their relationship to the Lord. Whether they had one and whether they were faithful as a Christian. Now, if they had one and were unfaithful, that's going to be a sad day. If they didn't have one, that's going to be a sad day. It's going to be a sad day because God gives all of us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to believe and obey his gospel. And yet, if we don't do it, 
We're going to pay the consequence of that. When a person dies, the only thing that's going to matter is their relationship to the Lord. And as far as other folks are concerned that we have an interest in and contact with is our relationship with them and our ability to influence them to obey the Lord. What else is going to matter? It won't matter what kind of house you lived in. It won't matter what kind of car you drove. It won't matter what kind of clothes you wore. Or it won't matter about the material blessings in life. One I owe them. The only thing that matters when a person dies is their relationship to the Lord, the influence that they had. And if you don't have that, it's a sad day. We have fellowship with God. Now, how do we enter into that fellowship with God? Now, that's a good question. I want to know how to go and become a Christian, become a child of God. How, how do I enter into a relationship with the Lord where I am in fellowship with Him? Well, if you'll turn your Bible to the Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, you'll find exactly what the Scripture says. It says, We're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When a person is baptized into Christ, he puts on Christ. Now, we're children of God by faith. That's what we are. How do we get that way? As many as have been baptized. That's the past tense. We are children of God by faith. We got that way by being baptized into Christ and putting on Christ. That's how we enter into fellowship with God. That's how we enter into relationship with Him. And that's how we can say our Father in heaven. But a third thought comes to my mind that I'm going to share with you in the closing moments of our study. And that's God's love. Think about that. That God loved us enough to want to be in fellowship with us. He loved us enough to give His own Son to die in our stead. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And one of the ways that we demonstrate our love toward our brethren is by assembling with the people of God. The Hebrew writer put it like this in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. He says, let us consider one another to provoke into love and good works, not the putting, <clears throat> let us consider one another to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. When we assemble with the saints, we are exhorting one another. We are encouraging one another. We're motivating one another. We're building one another up to love and good works. When I don't attend the services, and I could, I'm not talking about if I can't do it because of various reasons, but if I don't assemble the saints when I could, I'm neglecting to encourage my brethren like I should. We do that when we assemble. That's the way that we show our love and our good works. <clears throat> now, our love needs to be directed toward our brethren. As John wrote in 1 John 3, 16 through 18, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. For whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God dwell in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Behold what manner of love, John said in 1 John 3, 1, the Father hath bestowed upon us that he has enabled us to be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we're the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What a great blessing it is to be able to pray, Our Father in heaven. Our Father, the one with all authority, both in heaven and on earth. The one who wants us to be in fellowship with him, the one who loves us and gave his son so that we can be with him when this life is over. So that we can call God our father, we can call Jesus our brother, we can call one another brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no greater blessing in this world than to be able to call God our father. If you're in this assembly now and you can't do that because you've never been baptized for remission of your sins, to enter into Christ, you need to think seriously about it, you need to do it. If you're a child of God gone astray, as publicly as you sin, that's how public you need to make a confession, make the, make the wrongs right that you've done in your life. While together we stand and sing, we invite you to come.